this session on Moravian humor. And uh, it has been said that the difference between a truly devout religious person and a fanatic is the ability to laugh at oneself. <laughs> and over the past 555 years, we Moravians have come upon a lot to laugh about ourselves with. Uh, we won't be going back quite that far. Uh, but uh, many of you may remember uh, Al Frank, uh, who was with the Music Foundation for a while, and he and I were seminary roommates. And Albert knew everybody and everything, and uh, we both enjoyed a good story, so we kept telling these stories. And uh, when Nola and I would have to go up there to Bethlehem, uh, we'd visit with him, and one evening, sitting out on his back deck with our pipes and appropriate beverage, uh, we started telling these stories, and Nola had a tape recorder. And uh, so she got a bunch of them down and took and, it from there. Well, I got these down on tape, about two hours worth. And then I took them home, and I thought, well, I'm just going to play the tape and type them into the computer. It took me days because I kept having to stop the machine. I was laughing too hard to type. <laughs> so this is a bit of Moravian humor uh, in our oral tradition. Uh, some of them are actually historical. Um, some of them are not quite, but are things that maybe should have happened. So we yeah. will start our stories. And these are in no particular order, just as Albert and I happen to think of them. And, the first one uh, concerns Brother Samuel Allen, who was uh, Walser Allen's father. And he served for a long time in Jamaica. And one time he had to do baptisms in a church that was not his own. So he had not really known uh, the parents. Uh, and uh, he asked beforehand, what's the child's name? Uh, and the mother replied, E Pinaponche, sir. And he said, I must have misheard this, but when I ask her in the service, surely I'll heal better. So they get to the point in the service, what is the child's name? And she says, E Pinaponche. And he says, well, they come up with some strange names here, but okay, Pinaponche, into the death of Jesus, I bet. Well, after the mother came up and was in, just angry and said, why did you call my child that? This was what she told me. She said, no, as she showed him the piece of paper which she had pinned upon the child so that he could read it. <laughs> Even upon child, sir. <laughs> and then there was another one when uh, a mother came to register her child for baptism, and uh, this time he asked ahead of time, uh, what is the name? And she said, Damnastinus. And I said, Madam, you cannot possibly baptize the child damn nastiness. <laughs> and she said, but he's in the book, holding the Bible. He said, show me in the book. And she flipped, and sure enough, there was Demosthenes. <laughs> Brother S.H. Gap was pastor of Central Moravian Church in Bethlehem from 1918 to 1925, and at that time he became elected to the Provincial Elders Conference, but he kept his membership at Central until he died in 1962. But soon after, Brother C.R. Milik, who was installed as pastor at Central, Brother Milik, he noticed that everybody in the congregation sat at the back of the church, except for Brother Gap and his family, and they always sat in, in the second or third row from the front. Now, if you've ever been to Central Church, if you're in the pulpit, you can't see the first few rows. It's way high, and you cannot see anything up until the 8th or 10th row back. One Sunday morning, Brother Miley had had it with all these people sitting at the back, and he stood up and announced during the service, the congregation from here on will please move forward. I detest this terrible gap between us. <laughs> Bishop Gap told Albert that story. <laughs> this one's yours. And now, on a little more personal note, when I went to Memorial Church on St. Thomas as pastor, it was during Lent. And we arrived about a week before I was to be installed on the Sunday. Uh, so I went down for the Wednesday evening Lenten service. And it happened that Bishop Gooby, uh, had been invited to preach a series of Lenten sermons. He had 
retired, gone back to Britain, but was in the islands for a while, so they had invited him to speak during Lent. And he began the service by saying, some of you here this evening may recall that in 1920-something, uh, I was pastor of this congregation for a period of eight months, which was quite long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and you can imagine that gave me some pause, realizing I was to be installed as pastor the very next <laughs> Sunday. Uh, I only made about 11 months, I think, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, another one from around that time, uh, in the late 1950s, Marvin Henkelman uh, had gone down to the islands to serve as pastor at Memorial, and it was in a very bad state of repair inside the church at the time, including the steps growing, going up again to the very high pulpit, uh, and uh, they were pretty shaky. Now, Brother Edwin Quartz from the mission board was down there to visit, and he was preaching on this Sunday morning. Uh, and he said he was walking up to the pulpit, minding where he was going, and all of a sudden he stopped and listened on the creaky steps to the hymn the congregation was singing. Uh, as he was mounting those stairs, they were singing, Courage, Brother, Do Not Stumble. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you, closer to home, some of you may remember in the 69 hymnal, the liturgy for Second Advent, uh, and uh, I was always amused by the prayer that ended, and may we all be accounted worthy to stand before thee, the rubric, all shall be seated. <laughs> we fixed that in the yes. new book. <laughs> Brother Howard Rontaller was presiding at communion at home church. And the ministers came in, four ministers in a line, the presiding minister goes behind the table, the other three line up in front of the table to hand off their patents to the presiding minister. Just happened that Brother Rontaller lifted up the cover and discovered there was no bread in any of the trays. They had not been filled. So he simply said, brethren, we shall retire. And they went out in good liturgical order, filled up the bread trays, came back in, without batting an eye, and the congregation, as far as we know, didn't know anything was wrong, sort of wondering what this extra procession was all about. <laughs> Brother Howard Rontaller seems to have had his problems at the communion table occasionally. When he was resident professor at Moravian College, Lidditz in Pennsylvania was between pastorates, and he needed to go down there to conduct a German communion service, which he could, he could do this, provided everything was written out for him. So he got down there, went over everything with the organist, got into the service itself. Well, it was time for the communion prayer. And the prayer, which he had written out, had dropped out of his book. So he started, Herr unser Gott, and lowered his head and mumbled for a little while. <laughs> Raised his head, Lieber Christus, dear Christ, lowered his head and mumbled a little while, and finally said, Amen. <laughs> After the service, a woman came up to him and thanked him for that most fervent communion prayer. <laughs> Little did she know. <laughs> Brother John Taylor Hamilton was a very short man with a high-pitched voice. And you know, I mentioned the, the very high pulpit at Central Moravian Church. He was preaching there one Sunday. He got into that high pulpit, and they could barely see the top of his head over the Bible when he announced, be not afraid, it is I. <laughs> and of course, misreadings, particularly in the Holy Week readings, are uh, something we have to watch, but there are a few classics that came along. Uh, this one uh, was from Bob Ryerson when he was serving at Niski on St. Thomas. And three years in a row at that dramatic point where Peter has betrayed the Lord and the sun is just coming up, and according to the prophecy, the crock coo. <laughs> and he did it three years in a row. <laughs> the third time, Annalise just got up and walked. <laughs> uh, 
there was also the time, and I'm not sure if it was Bob who said this, but one in the readings announced that Anus, being high priest of the Jews, <laughs> I'm not sure what's the theological commentary. <laughs> uh, and then there was Gordon Spa uh, at home church, uh, who once announced, and the wig tree fithered. <laughs> Uh, then there was Cornelius Minert at Communion at Central, who began the solemn service with the announcement, Gracie, Mercy, and Peacey. <laughs> Gracie, Mercy, and Peacey. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then Sam Zeller, who, well, most of you wouldn't know, he's before almost my time, uh, but he was <laughs> preaching at Central and was leading the litany. And he prayed, bless our and all other heathen congregations gathered from among the Christians. You kind of wonder if that was a mistake. Yeah, we were not sure on that one. Uh, and then there was a similar thing in seminary chapel during my time there. Uh, when we were, uh, during the litany, the one who is leading it pray, uh, may we be delivered from blood and warshed. <laughs> Anyway. You all remember Bishop Higgins, Bishop George Higgins. At his 80th birthday, a group of friends and clergy gave a special celebration dinner for him. And at the end of all the laudatory speeches and everything, they asked Bishop Higgins, after your 80 years, do you have any words of advice you can give to us? And Bishop Higgins stood up, went to the podium, and said, yes. Never, ever miss an opportunity to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I must say, in our travels, we tried to yes. adhere to his advice. Yes, the, the day we were in the five-hour traffic jam, we were so glad for Bishop Higgins. <laughs> that same George Higgins used to preach without notes, or without looking at his notes. One Sunday, though, he lost his train of thought in the middle of his sermon, stopped, Pulled his manuscript out of his pocket, looked, saw where he was, stuck it back in his pocket, looked at the congregation and said, hmm, bet you thought I didn't use one of those things, did you? <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Back to the Virgin Islands again. Uh, there was some youth camp they were, were beginning and, and redoing. Uh, and... Uh, where they were at Saint, uh, on St. Croix at Midlands, uh, and they built a huge cistern, two caverns, and a bathhouse. And the conference superintendent, none other than, again, Bob Ryerson, uh, told Al Frank, who was doing an internship there, that they should have a service to get people out there to see everything and should have a formal dedication of these new buildings. Uh, and Albert happened to be camp director, so it fell to him to arrange this, uh, and uh, Bob said to him, but now be careful what hymns you pick. We don't want any unfortunate uh, connotations here. Well, people were giving Albert uh, suggestions of all kinds uh, about various hymns. Uh, for instance, somebody suggested, Behold the Throne of Grace. Remember, this is a bathhouse. Uh, Majestic Sweetness Sits Enthroned. Uh, or the ever popular, There Will Be Showers of Blessing. And Albert knew better than to do anything like that. Uh, but he thought he would use two very traditional, very well-known and safe hymns. And one of which was sing hallelujah, praise the Lord. That went fine. But then they got to the last one, which was Jesus still lead on. Sounds safe enough. But he totally forgot the third stanza which begins, when we seek relief from a long-felt grief. <laughs> we, were, we were in Bethlehem at a concert, and they happened to sing that me and Albert and Nola in a row and completely lost we it. We disgraced ourselves badly. <laughs> Dave Schatzneider said, what, what was with you people? That's right. <laughs> at another campfire at a synod uh, in the islands, each island conference had to do a skit. And they came up from the provinces, starting from Trinidad and coming north, and the skits just got, according to Albert, raunchier and raunchier. 
At the end of all these skits, Albert had been instructed by the chairman of the PEC to have a serious closing to the campfire. <laughs> so he had made arrangements to have, with Bishop Gooby to have the closing prayer and then to have a closing hymn. But Bishop Gooby had said, we need something to transition away from these skits into our closing service. So Albert just announced the hymn. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. <laughs> Well, Brother Hamilton again. This is, or is this Brother Kenneth Hamilton as a missionary? Yes, this yes, is Brother this Kenneth is Hamilton, missionary in Nicaragua. He had to go up river to serve communion, and he forgot to take the grape juice with him. So what do you do? He did the only thing he could, he could do, which was to take a water purification tablet, which turned the water purple, and that's what he used. Some of the churches in Nicaragua were built so that there was a door right behind the pulpit. Brother Howard Stortz had gone to one of these places, and he was sitting in the chair between the pulpit and the door during the hymn before the sermon. Well, Brother Stortz forgot to behave himself, and he reared back in the chair like he was going to sit on its back two legs, and he fell out of the church. <laughs> he walked around to the front and came in again. That was a particular favorite story of Albert's, but when we were in Herrenhut, Albert happened to be leading the Zingstunde one night in the Herrenhut church. And he also leaned back in his chair, not realizing there was a movable platform, which the chair was sitting right on the edge of. And as it went back, the platform started going further and further <laughs> out. And he didn't go over, but it was a sort of teeter-totter until two of the very stately Zaldiner, the chapel servants there in Herenhut, uh, quietly walked forward and pushed the platform back, thus elevating Brother Frank, who <laughs> continued the service without any uh, notice. <laughs> uh, let's see. This would have been about Walser mm -hmm. Allen. Uh, he was a big one for preaching series of sermons. And he once preached a series of 40 sermons on Moses. After, 40 days and 40 nights. After about 40 30 of them, wilderness. one of his parishioners went up to him and said, I certainly will be glad to meet Moses when I finally get to heaven. And I'm going to tell him, I don't need to spend any time with you. I've already heard everything you ever did. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my uncle. Ah, uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I remember too in uh, the minister's conference when Bishop Hamilton was in the southern province as a passage was read out of Jude referring to guardian angels and we got into a discussion about guardian angels which are not real big in Moravian theology and some of us younger whippersnappers were poo-pooing the idea as papist <laughs> nonsense uh, and Bishop Hamilton quietly said you know, I too never saw the sense of guardian angels either. After all, we have the Savior, and that should be enough. And then he said, I read this passage in Jude, which indeed does seem to say that we each have a guardian angel. And then I thought, well, I must not be prideful. If God has seen fit to give me a guardian angel, I should simply say, thank you. <laughs> However, on um, not quite such a pious and tender note. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Brother J. Kenneth Fole was dedicating a church, or it was a cornerstone laying or something, because it was outside, and it was hot. He went on and on, as he was wont to do for some time, and a lady in the congregation was overcome by the heat, and she fainted. They picked her up, carried her away into the shade, got some water, revived her, and let her sit there for a while to be sure she was all right. She came back to the service quite a little while later to find that Bishop Fole was still praying. <laughs> I had a cousin who fell asleep during one of his prayers, standing up. <laughs> but when Bishop Warren Sautobin of blessed memory was ordained, Bishop Hoyler had the service, and he opened the book to the wrong page when it came to the ordination questions, he asked Warren the questions for confirmation. 
Then he realized what he'd done, turned the page, and asked him the questions for ordination. So Warren was the most amply ordained deacon in the Moravian church. <laughs> well, while we were working on the Moravian Book of Worship, which came out way back in 1995, it's not the new yes, book. Yes, the new hymnal is 17 years old. <laughs> there was, as you may recall, a lot of apprehension in the church as to what was going to be in it. And indeed, there was a lot of fear of change and quite a bit of opposition to the whole process. Knowing this to be true, the hymnal committee had decided that it would be well that as many members as possible get out and speak in the various churches to allay some of the fears and, and all of that and to let them know what was really going on. Well, it happened that I was assigned to go to a church which is listed here but shall remain nameless for the moment. Uh, and I, it was nice springtime. I was going up the walk to the church before the service. They were still in Sunday school. You know, I like to get places early. And there was a young girl standing there in a very pretty spring dress and crinoline pinna, petticoats, just as cute as a button. And uh, so I made sure to say good morning to her. And she looked at me and said, uh, are you from the hymnal committee? And I said, yes, I am. And she said, can I see your horns and tail? <laughs> and I said, what? And she said, well, my daddy said one of those devils from the hymnal committee was preaching this morning. <laughs> a little later on in the process, proofreading the hymnal was quite a job, uh, 900 and some pages. One of the hymns that we put in the hymnal was by John Dallas, who's a Presbyte uh, Pennsylvania hymn writer, and it's called May God's Love Be Fixed Above You. Modern technology reared its ugly head, and the proof that I received from the engraver was May God's Love Be Faxed Above You. <laughs> John Dallas loved that. He thought that was great. Another interesting mistake. You know the line, mine is the sin and thine the righteousness? What came back from the typesetter was mine is the skin? <laughs> and instead of he gives our daily bread, we got he give sour daily bread. <laughs> I think we caught all of those. <laughs> well, we, we had a we deliberately met all over the country when we were working on this and one time we were out in Wisconsin and as, if you know Wisconsin you know that the uh, roads out in the country don't have names they simply have letters you know rural road, route, county, road a. county road A, county road B, C and then when they run out they simply have county road AA and BB well, we were out driving and trying to find where we were going, and it's dark as everything. And I looked up and saw that we were indeed on County Road ZZ. <laughs> and I simply remarked, brethren, we have come to the jumping off place. <laughs> yeah. Back again to the Eastern West Indies. Uh, Brother John Knight was ordained in 1936, and soon thereafter he went to his first synod as a young deacon in the eastern West Indies province. And as some young deacons do, he had a comment to make about every single issue that came up. And finally one of the old missionaries looked at him, took him aside, and said, young man, Deacons are to be seen and not heard. <laughs> <laughs> now, again, personal, when I went to St. Thomas, uh, we had a good number of shut-ins at Memorial Congregation, and I spent a good bit of my time visiting them and serving communion to them. And when I first got there, they said, you take communion to these people, but the minister does not take communion with the shut-ins. And I, of course, had been in the custom of having communion with the shut-ins, and I was sort of offended. Uh, you know, why wouldn't I want to share in this with the shut-ins? And then I realized that they use real wine there for communion. And I could do 15 or 20 of these, and I figured about after the 15th or 20th shot of wine in the morning, I'd have a hard time finding the manse. On the way back. <laughs> so then I saw the wisdom of that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then again on St. Thomas, there was our famous Easter band of 1980. And of course, you recall the Salem band with its hundreds of people. Well, we didn't quite have that. My Easter band consisted of a saxophone and two drums. <laughs> and the fellow uh, who was playing the saxophone was playing from memory, and the only tune he knew, apparently, was up from the grave he arose. <laughs> And all the way from the church way out to the graveyard, we must have had that about 15 times, added to the fact that the fella had been up all night playing at a club beforehand, uh, getting his tips and drinks. And so our Easter procession was a little bit zigzag that year. As we were. Many of you have heard this uh, event when Home Church Number 1, sometime in the early 1990s, was playing at one of the downtown hotels here overnight, oh, 2.30 or so in the morning. Some of the guests at these hotels are not really thrilled. Uh, they don't, they're not all forewarned. They're not all here for Easter. So you hear this band playing outside of your window at 2.30 in the morning. One actually threw a jar of peanut butter out the window at the band. It didn't hit anybody, but it really is a shame somebody didn't have the presence of mind to shout, well, send the crackers. <laughs> <laughs> and a much, much older story. Johann Friedrich Peter, our composer whom we so revere and so love, was one of the most tireless composers and workers for music, both in the 10 years that he was here in Salem and then also Bethlehem and everywhere else that he served. Um, he was a good performer on violin and on the organ, and he composed a great many pieces. <clears throat> and he, they say that we don't have a picture of him, but they say that he was of a quick, nervous temperament and inclined to mix things up when he got excited. It is related that upon an occasion of a public concert in 1806, while he was performing on the violin, not holding it quite tight enough under his chin, it slipped out, went over his shoulder, and landed in his behind him. There went his violin in the middle of the concert. On another occasion, though, he, the music was slipping from the music stand, and he tried to catch it. While this happened, the violin bow slipped. He's trying to recover both the music and the violin bow. The violin went somewhere else. The music stand fell over, and on top, he fell on top of the whole mess. My report says, causing a mo... Uh, Sensation which has not been forgotten in 1870. 142 years after that, we're still talking about poor brother Peter falling in a concert. So, can you imagine? Poor fellow. Oh, yes. During the Second World War in Germany, one of the, bre the brethren from one of the congregations was serving on the Eastern Front. People back home, of course, in Herrenhut would write him letters to let him know what was going on and particularly things about the band because he played in the band. One of the letters said, said and Tuesday morning, it being brother so-and-so's birthday, we went and blew him up. <laughs> That's the idiom for waking somebody up by playing outside their resident, Aufblasen, to blow them up. All the letters, of course, had to be read by the military censors, and so this censor called our brother in and said, what kind of people do you come from blowing up this poor man on his birthday? <laughs> well, Brother Sam Tesh, during his first pastorate at Emmanuel, and this was about 1930, and no, I wasn't there quite yet, <laughs> uh, but uh, you may remember the old Emmanuel Church, the wooden building, uh, and they had a heater in the floor with a grate over it, one of the old floor furnaces. And it was always very temperamental. And it happened one evening as Brother Tesh was reading the assigned scripture lesson, which was about the call of Isaiah. And he got to the part where it says, and the temple was filled with smoke. <laughs> Suddenly there was a whoosh and clouds began rolling out. <laughs> Then again at Emmanuel, this is when I was about 12 years old. Uh, they still had Sunday evening services, but they were shifting away from more formal services, more to a Bible study format. And Dr. Tesh, as he was then, was talking about the church, and someone asked him, Brother Tesh, can you get to heaven without being a member of the church? 
And he thought for a minute, and he said, well, I guess you can get to Europe by swimming, but it's a lot easier to take the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Moravian theological answer. Well, we have come about for this one and the last okay. one. This story was told to me by Anna Baer in 1998, I think it was. So this one is, was Anna's memory. Somebody told her this. So this is about third hand. Someone was being in the dentist's office, having the impressions taken where you have to sit there for like a half an hour while it hardens. And she was waiting for, felt like forever. And this woman could hear a man in the next room. And there was silence for a moment. And then she would hear, Lord, our God. And then silence. And she would hear, our dear Lord Jesus Christ. And so on. The dentist came back into her room and she said, Doctor, you better go check on that man next door. He sounds like he's in terrible pain. And the dentist responded, Oh, don't worry. That's just Bishop Fole getting used to his new dentures. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's lots more of these, as you can see. Maybe we'll do a part two sometime. But having started on the Foles, I think we should finish with the Foles. Uh, and this is when Bishop and Mrs. Fole were in Europe for a unity meeting. And she had gone with him, and of course, as you know, she's very well known for her proper ways. Uh, and they were staying with a German family, the church being unwilling to pay for hotels then as now. Uh, and uh, they slip upstairs. So the next morning, she gets up bright and early and comes downstairs, and the lady of the house is there cooking breakfast. Uh, and Mrs. Fole wanted to thank them uh, for their hospitality and was also trying to improve her German. And so she wanted to thank them in German, and she said, Danke, and they said, fine. And the woman asked, how did you sleep? Uh, and uh, she answered, uh, well, what she wanted to say, that was the best mattress I've ever slept on. Okay. Thus far, the best, uh, best uh, matraza for Ani, you know. Well, unfortunately, instead of matraza, which is mattress, she said the word matroza, which means sailor. That was the best <laughs> sailor I ever slept on. And when we were there in 1999, <laughs> They were still telling that about Mrs. Fold. That's in when here. we heard that story. <laughs> well, as Daniel said, there are a great many more of these, uh, and there are stories that we have thought of since sitting on Albert's deck and listening. A and a few that we're waiting for the. That we can't tell yet. Yeah. They, <laughs> well, a few more have been called home. <laughs> yes. But anyway, our hope is to keep collecting these stories because they're just too good to lose as part of, they give us a flavor of the Moravian Church worldwide, and I know there are plenty more of these out there, so as you have stories that need to be added to this collection, we hope you'll share them with us so that we can. Our next lunch lecture will be the second Thursday in September. Uh, I don't have the date in front of me, and on top of that, we haven't decided what we're talking about yet. <laughs> so we'll get the word out, but second Thursday in September at 1215, right here. And if you have things you'd like us to study and talk about, let us know. Yeah, Betsy. I just want to thank you. This has been a wonderful series. Well, and thank you. you have done so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay. What you were listening to when you came in, by the way, was the recording from this year's Great Sabbath service. Um, it will be released as a CD. Uh, I'm going to put it back on while you're getting ready to leave so you can listen to a little bit more. This was recorded live. It's not quite ready for release yet, but it will be sometime in the summer. And there are order forms sitting right over there. All right. So I'm going to put that back on. And thank you all for coming. Have a fabulous summer, and we'll see you in September. Wasn't that a song? That is. Yeah. The 13th of September. Uh -huh.